the use of AI at some of the world's leading restaurants, phase zero implementation planning, and how to predict digital transformation failure. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover here in episode number 166 of Transformation Ground Control. Welcome to Transformation Ground Control. Ground Control. The podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation. This podcast features technology agnostic and international discussions related to digital strategy, software selection, implementation, change management, business process optimization, and everything else you need to know to make your digital transformation project successful. Whether you're embarking on an ERP implementation, supply chain transformation, or any other business or digital transformation, this podcast is for you. You. Now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. And Third Stage Consulting is an independent technology agnostic consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their digital transformations. And joining me, as always, is Darian Fiakuski. Darian, thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back. <laughs> Absolutely. Good to have you back from vacation. Uh, Darian's been traveling the world in Ireland, so uh, she's back on the show here with us this week. So glad to have you back. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we're both uh, with uh, involved with Third Stage Consulting, and this show is sponsored by Third Stage Consulting, not coincidentally, by the way. And the show is produced by Major Tom Productions. You can learn more about Major Tom by going to majortom-productions.com. I've included contact information below as well if you'd like to learn more about uh, the podcast and how to get involved with this, this show. Um, the podcast has new episodes every Wednesday. Uh, you can find new episodes at transformationgroundcontrol.com. And this is the podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation, including the people process, technology, strategy, aspects of digital transformation and ERP implementation. So glad you could be here today. Glad you could join us. And again, if you want to see past episodes of the show, as well as keep up with future episodes as they're released, you can always just go to transformationgroundcontrol.com. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to, first of all, dive into uh, some social media questions that we've received over the last few days on social media. Um, that'll be in our opening segment. And then during our opening segment, we'll also get into a couple of interesting, noteworthy news topics related to technology. We'll get into Apple's uh, RCS messaging and how they're countering some of the antitrust monop monopolistic sorts of uh, issues they're facing legally. And uh, we'll talk about what that means to Apple users as well as other uh, smartphone users beyond that. Um, so we'll talk about that. And we'll also get into Yum! Brands. And if you don't know Yum! Brands, uh, Yum Brands is the holding company, the parent company that owns Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and Kentucky Fried Chicken, or KFC as it's better known nowadays. Um, those three restaurants are owned by Yum Brands, and what Yum is doing is they're starting to deploy AI uh, to make for a better customer experience and to make their operations more efficient, more profitable. So we're going to dive into the sort of a use case of how Yum Brands is using AI in their business to improve their business. and. It's continuing with the theme of AI. We cover AI a lot on the show, and it's uh, hopefully a good – give us some good ideas on how we might start to think about AI within our own enterprises, even if we're not in the restaurant industry. So we'll get into that there in the opening segment. And then later in the show, we'll have our, our guest. Our interview guest is going to be Adam Cheatham from the Third Stage Consulting Team. He's a managing director here who helps uh, manage all of our project teams, all of our directors that are managing multiple clients. Um, so he's exposed all of our clients throughout the world, and he is going to be on the show with me talking about phase zero implementation planning and basically what you need to do to get ready for implementation and what some of the common mistakes are that organizations make during the planning phase. So we'll dive into that with Adam later in the show. And then later, finally, after Adam is on the show, we'll also dive into how to predict digital transformation failure. What are the, some of the things you need to be on the lookout for and some of the trends that we see with failures and things that tell us as consultants that the project is likely to fail. And of course, we share this with the idea that you will hopefully avoid doing those things. So that's the, the purpose there with that conversation. So before we get into all this stuff, though, um, Darian, what are some of the social media comments and questions you have for us here to cover today? Yeah, so to start, the first social media question came from your YouTube video on change management. And one of the comments said, Here's another take, resisting change because it, it goes against the fundamental values of the organization. Some changes are not actually helpful or necessary and have more to do with vanity projects. 
Eric, I want to get your take on this comment and if you agree or disagree. That's an interesting, um, interesting comment, uh, especially the, the use of the word vanity projects. Um, and, and I guess as I, if I sort of try to read between the lines or anticipate what I think the person is alluding to or what kind of culture this might be describing, it sounds like a situation where you might have different executives or leadership team members that are not on the same page with sort of rowing in the same direction on what changes might support the overall business. And instead, it sounds like it's suggestive of the fact that maybe there's individuals on the leadership team or within management that are focused more on themselves and, and projects that further their self-interest. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, or trying to interpret what a vanity project means, but I think I know what the person means by that. So I would say that that's probably a symptom of something greater, which is that the organization and the leadership team in particular is not on the same page with what digital transformation is and what the project means overall to the organization and how individuals within the organization can support and align with or, or sort of um, make sure they're rowing in the same direction of the overall goals and objectives of the project. So that would be my sort of knee-jerk reaction to it is it sounds like you've got an executive team and a leadership team that's not on the same page with what the transformation means and what the expectations are from the organization. And when you don't have that clarity of direction, what ends up happening is, of course, we as individuals are going to create our own direction. And if we as individuals are creating our own direction that doesn't necessarily consider the broader organization or the bigger picture strategy, we're probably going to do what would be considered a vanity project to help us individually, not necessarily help the entire organization. So that'd be my sort of knee-jerk reaction to it. I mean, my initial reaction to this question slash comment, I guess you could more say opinion on this video was just more maybe there is more change management within this specific company that would need to be done. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Great point. I mean, that I, I sort of shared what the problem is, but you're getting into what the, the cure is. And that is a good way to address that is to not necessarily shoot down or shut down a vanity project for shutting it down sake, but more to say, hey, let's make sure we're on the same page and let's spend some time um, defining what our goals and objectives are. And we have a whole framework and a whole workshop process that we facilitate with leaders within organizations to help get that sort of alignment um, within projects. So if anyone wants to chat through what that might look like or how to do that in more detail, that's certainly something I'd be happy to chat offline with um, audience members about if you've got a transformation where you're struggling with that same sort of thing. But you are right, Darian. I mean, change management, one of, one of the goals or one of the work streams within change management is and should be focused on making sure you get that alignment. And there's, a, there's an art and a science to how you do that, but it, it's a very good point. Yeah, definitely. So our, our second social question today came from LinkedIn. And this comment is, Eric, I saw your video on the top 10 manufacturing ERP systems and top 10 SME slash SMB systems. But some of those systems do not suit the 1 million to 5, 25 million companies. And so many excellent systems did not get a mention in the video. Do you think it is worth shining on the light on the 10 to 20 systems that he recommends regularly that are not quote unquote big names to regular um, bigger companies maybe? Great question, great point. And actually I agree with you. One of, the, one of the deficiencies with our top 10 list is that it's not gonna be relevant to everyone that looks at the list. And as hard as we try to cover different top 10 lists for different scenarios, whether it's, as he mentions, manufacturing being one, small and mid-sized businesses, which is what SMB stands for, for those that don't know. S SME, SMB is basically small and mid-market companies. Um, we do have lists for those, but for example, we don't have a list for small, smaller manufacturers. What are the top 10 lists for that? You know, that's going to look different than the overall manufacturing top 10 list. And top 10 lists, quite frankly, are somewhat subjective. I mean, we base it on data that we see with our client base, but there's also a certain amount of subjectivity that goes along with that. And I always tell people, yeah, you can use our top 10 list as a reference point, but certainly don't don't pick a software just because it's number one on one of our lists. That's not a good reason. I mean, it, it's number one for a reason because maybe it has higher market share. Or maybe we've seen more customers succeed with that product, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good fit for you. And every organization is different enough. And there's enough options out there that I would suggest look at your options and look at the entire top 10 list and look what options are outside the top 10 list. Continue to use it as a data point, but it's not all inclusive. Um, having said that, the other factor too 
is that when we do these top 10 lists, we're sifting through dozens, if not hundreds of different systems that could be in the top 10. A majority of them do not make the top 10, not because there's, there's only 10 good systems out there and the rest of them suck. That's not at all the situation. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good systems that are lesser known and I'll just rattle off a few. I mean, you've got, you've got companies like Decom and Acumatica, for example, that a lot of organizations haven't heard of, but a lot of manufacturing and uh, distribution types of companies will use those those companies or those those products. You've got Epicor, Infor; those are a little bit bigger, more a little bit more well known systems and vendors, but they're certainly not as well known as like SAP or Oracle or Microsoft. Um, and those are just a few examples. I mean, you, you get down into different industry verticals, you're going to have a bunch of different systems that you may not have ever heard of. Like in government public sector, there's a product called Tyler Technologies, which if you're not in government or the public sector, you've probably never heard of them, but they are very well known and they're, they're a pretty well-established software vendor. So I could spend this whole episode just talking about all the random technologies that are out there. But I think the, the lesson here, the takeaway is there's a lot of viable options that you may have never heard of. And just because a vendor advertises at the airport or at PGA golf tours or whatever the case may be, doesn't mean that that's a better product. It just means they're spending more on advertising and name recognition. But there's a lot of software vendors that don't do that, that spend a lot of money on R&D and creating great products. So um, I would just keep your mind open as you're looking at different options, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Some great social questions from our audience. I always love seeing what they have to say every week. So I think audience, if you guys have more questions for us to answer, if you want us to deep dive into other topics, make sure to leave your social questions on any of our social media or Eric's platforms. Yeah, absolutely. We love getting the, the audience questions because they're always so interesting and it gives us some good stuff to cover to open up with here on the show. So be sure to um, drop those questions wherever you're listening or watching here. You can even drop it in this episode of the, of the podcast if you'd like, or anytime you're watching or engaging with any of my content or third stages content, uh, feel free to drop those comments or questions there and we'll get to those as we go. So um, we're going to shift gears and get into a couple of news stories here in just a moment. We're going to talk about Apple's new RCS messaging platform that they're, they've recently announced. We're also going to talk about, which I'm really excited for, we're going to talk about how AI is being used at Yum! Brands. And Yum! Brands is the company that owns Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC, among other fast food uh, restaurants throughout the world. And they're starting to toy with AI. And we're going to talk about some of the AI use cases uh, for them, which will be interesting because we're always – exploring AI on the show, but we're also trying to explore not just AI as a concept, but AI and how it's being used, actually being used by enterprises throughout the organization. And a lot of companies are still trying to figure that out, trying to get their arms around it. So we're going to talk about how Young Brands is dealing with that, and that will hopefully be an interesting conversation. And then after that, we'll get it into our first uh, interview conversation to talk about phase zero implementation planning and what it is you should do before you get started on an implementation. Make sure you set yourself up for success. And that's going to be an interview with Adam Cheatham, who's managing director at Third Stage Consulting. So we're colleagues, and he'll be on the show to talk about that. And then later in the show, we'll get into how to predict digital transformation failure. More specifically, I'll talk about how I predict uh, failure. And uh, the lesson being, don't do those things. Let's do less of those things and more of other stuff instead. And so we'll, we'll get to that later in the show. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling, and I'm the CEO and founder of Third Stage Consulting. Before we dive too far into today's content, I want to invite you to learn a little bit more about Third Stage Consulting, who we are and what we do. We help clients through their entire digital transformation life cycles, beginning with digital strategy, software evaluation and selection, all the way through and including implementation planning, implementation readiness, and the actual implementation itself. We're technology agnostic, so we only represent our clients' best interests. We do not represent software vendors. But having said that, we work very closely with software vendors, all the leading players that you can imagine we've worked with both in helping clients evaluate and select them, but also in helping clients implement those solutions as well. So we have a very broad objective agnostic view of the market that is meant to really represent your interest as you go through your digital transformation. I also encourage you to scan this QR code right here to get access to our resource center. This resource center has a ton of information, a ton of eBooks that are free. You have access to top 10 software rankings, playbooks for how to make your project more successful, guides to change management, YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff that are going to help you through your digital transformation. So I encourage you to scan this QR code to get access to those resources. 
And please feel free to reach out to me directly to brainstorm ideas about your project. Even if it's just informally, you want to bounce around some ideas and get some informal advice, I'd be happy to spend some time with you. So feel free to reach out to me. I've included my contact information below. You can also find it in the description field of this video as well. The last thing you want to have happen is for your digital transformation to end up in court. I've been doing this for 20 years and I have seen everything. My name is Marcus Harris. I'm a software and technology attorney focusing my practice on drafting and negotiating software-related contracts and litigating software disputes across the country. Feel free to reach out to us at taflaw.com. We'd love to talk to you about the litigation process and what you can expect. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. Thank you for being here today. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy sides of transformation. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday, as well as past episodes of the show at transformationgroundcontrol.com. This show is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. So thank you for being here today. Um, so Darian, you've got a couple of really interesting newsworthy stories to cover here today in the technology transformation space. What have you got in store for us? Yeah, so the first one I find very interesting as an Apple user myself, but it's after a very long holdout, Apple will finally be adopting RCS messaging standardized through all iPhones. This will be a software update that comes in 2025, so we still won't see this for probably another year. Um, but the company told multiple news outlets that they're bringing a wider range of texting features to conversations between iPhone and Android users. So, you know, when you usually text an iPhone to iPhone, you see the blue bubbles, you see the texting, if you see somebody's like waiting to send a message, um, you see red receipts, all these other features that um, you don't get if you're texting somebody with an Android. And so they haven't said all of the things that will come with RCS messaging, but we can assume that we will see some new features that we see when texting other iPhones, you'll see that when now you're texting Androids. Um, so it'll be very interesting. We don't know if like the color will change, if it'll be green messages, blue messages still. Um, but overall, we know that there is going to be a change that comes in with the Apple messaging um, and Android messaging in the next year, which I think will be really interesting to see the impacts of do you, more users now go away from Apple because they're going to get the same features whether they have an iPhone or not? Uh, but Eric, I would love to hear your opinion on this. Do you see the adoption of Apple creating motivation in technology in general, more compatible in integration in the future between more companies? Do you think this is going to be something that is streamlined across businesses in general? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that interoperability model is something we're seeing a lot, certainly in the enterprise tech space. And what you're talking about here with Apple is not enterprise technology. This is more consumer technology. But enterprise and business technology, you see it a lot where you need that interoperability. And you always see that trade-off for that. Um, yeah, the trade-off is probably the right word. Trade-off between the open systems like Microsoft Dynamics and the more closed proprietary systems like SAP S4 HANA. Different strengths and weaknesses to those models. Um, we certainly see a lot of clients that prefer the openness and the open architecture and the ease of integration with Microsoft D365, but others, you know, just grew up in the SAP world and are, are comfortable with that proprietary programming language and architecture. So, you know, I, I think in the enterprise technology space, we're already seeing a big resurgence or a movement towards interoperability and open architectures and things like that. Um, certainly in the consumer space, I think is even more important, largely because, you know, from, from a regulatory perspective, governments oftentimes will insist that you have some sort of interoperability and uh, open integration, open platform, so that you're not creating an unfair advantage. I know that's something that Microsoft has struggled with on the legal front, especially in the EU. Um, EU has sued Microsoft, I think, multiple times over, you know, having not a, not a closed architecture, because I know I just mentioned that Microsoft Dynamics 365 has an open architecture. But what Microsoft has been accused of in the past is on the consumer facing side, um, for example, putting um, their own their own browser, their own proprietary browser on every Windows machine. Um, other internet browser providers, like I think, uh, I don't remember who, but other, over the years, this is a long time ago, this happened 20 years ago maybe, um, other internet browser software providers sued Microsoft because they were creating sort of an unfair advantage by, by locking people in to Microsoft products versus, 
you know, making it easier to access and use non-Microsoft products. So I think that might be what Apple is responding to. Is there a regulatory component to this? Is there like any sort of lawsuit or regulatory thing happening in the background that you are aware of here, Darian? Yeah, so I believe that um, Apple did face a lawsuit based, basically saying that um, they were creating like an unfair monopoly because of some of these features that um, weren't able to integrate with other phones as Androids. Um, so I believe that was a lawsuit that came out just recently against them, and then they announced this just recently after that came out. So I would assume this was because of that lawsuit, but there's a confirmation there. So Yeah. Well, I think it's a good thing. I mean, it's, you know, I know it is frustrating, like just as a, I, I prefer Apple. I'm not going to switch Apple products just because they've made it more easy to potentially switch. So I'll, I'll stay an Apple loyalist for sure, but it is nice to know now when I'm texting or inter engaging with someone with a, with an Android phone that even I'm not, you know, limited because it, I'm dealing with someone that's not an Apple. So I think it'll actually help Apple customers uh, in some ways and make it better for them too. Um, so I'll be curious to see how that unfolds for others as well. Yeah, I think one thing I'm excited for, which is just a small thing, but being able to see red receipts, I know you can turn them on and off actually, but um, like, for example, my dad doesn't have an I I iPhone. So he when I text him, it's green and I can't see if he read my messages. Um, so it's nice to know whether or not if yeah. people have an Android or something like that, you can see if they're reading your text, if they do opt to have that on, um, like if you were texting somebody with an iPhone. So I think stuff like that, the little things will kind of be cool for consumers overall. Yeah. And speaking of that, I sent you a text message a few minutes ago and it <laughs> said it says it's red, but you never responded. What's uh, what's going on there? <laughs> I'm busy, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're in the middle of something right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. But I'm really excited to get in this next topic too. I know we've do dived into a lot of AI recently on this podcast, but we haven't really talked about it in the restaurant industry and how, we're, how restaurants are implementing it, which is what this next article will talk about. So it's about Yum! Brands, which includes Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, KFC, and other um, fast food restaurant chains around the world and it is about how they recently deeply deeply invested into ai technology to transform its operations the company came out and said that 45 percent of their sales roughly 30 billion of them otherwise you could say are digital sales so they are really starting to experiment with how can ai help um, automate this and uh, potentially make it better for the consumers but they are also experimenting with potential ai's taking orders for customers in the drive-thru or using AI technology to figure out how long the wait is in the drive-thru so they can tell their customers that and overall just kind of improve the experience at restaurants for their consumers. Um, I think another big thing with this is post-pandemic there has been, uh, they have seen a shortage of um, workers that are able to come in and then also how much you have to pay those workers. Um, so they are going to potentially explore with AI and how they can use AI in order to maybe help with some of those issues that they are facing as um, a company. Eric, what do you think about this whole thing with Restaurants Yum AI really diving into um, AI? I know it's um, something that we've seen a lot, but I, I don't know if we've seen this big implementation in restaurants before. So it's kind of cool to um, really dive into this. Yeah, I think it's really cool, and I and I think the low hanging fruit uh, of the of the fact that Yum Brands deals with or manages these really high volume restaurants that are fast food, and just you know every second that it takes longer to deliver food or to generate that extra revenue can have a material effect on their on their bottom line. So I I could see why Yum Brands might be an early adopter of AI because they have so much to gain from being efficient and anticipating demand and things like that. What, what I'm excited about, and what I always think about is like, you know, you mentioned optimizing drive throughs and staffing to make sure you've got the right staff to, to handle any sort of spike in demand and um, optimizing the drive through so people are getting through there as fast as possible. So again, you can generate more revenue and profit. But I also think about like, is there a way to use uh, third party data within these AI models to say like, you know, there's a, it's going to be a really warm day tomorrow or, um, you know, tomorrow, for example, just thinking out loud here, but uh, in the United States, baseball season is coming up and they have op what they call opening day, which is in the spring, usually the weather's nice. And so if you had opening day happening near a Taco Bell, it's it's reasonable to expect that you're going to see a huge spike in demand of of drive through or just 
customer demand in general for that Taco Bell that's near a baseball stadium on opening day. That's, that might be an obvious example, but there's there's things like that you can think about, like weather patterns or other macro patterns that if you could take that data and use AI to anticipate that, hey, we should probably staff up because our AI model is telling us that we'll probably see a spike in demand, that could be another way to, to really optimize as well. So I, I think it's super cool. And I'd, be, I'd love to see more about that or, or hear more about what they're what they're doing there. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to consider it. I mean, you could even think about, let's say, Dairy Queen or something like that, right? Ice cream, if it's a really warm day, like you said, maybe they're going to see um, really, really long drive through lines and it's going to be wrapped around the corner. So um, how can you make that line go faster? Do you need people out taking orders that are outside the building, kind of like Chick-fil-A does maybe or something on those days? I think there's a lot of different ways that businesses can utilize AI to then just um, improve these operations that um, they maybe won't be able to predict otherwise without using this technology. So I think that's super cool. But I think there's one thing that um, for customers that they might be concerned with is maybe the customer recognition, if there's any sort of recognition um, AI, whether they're ordering like on a screen or something like that, maybe there's a camera that can recognize their face and know what they ordered before. So that kind of gets into what what should be the privacy and like the data laws behind all that, which I know we've talked about before, but I think it really um, gets interesting because what if you just go to, um, let's say you go to Taco Bell a lot like in Yum Brands and you can just order on the screen and if it starts to recognize your order, do you as a consumer like that or would you rather just not have them recognize your patterns and stuff like that on the daily? So I think that's something um, interesting to dive into as well. Yeah, it's a great point. You know, data privacy and AI may be in direct conflict for years to come, you know, because of that. I think on one hand, it could provide a better customer experience if you allow young brands and others just to use that sort of customer data. But the privacy side of things might suggest that, you know, a customer has a right to privacy and, and not share that data. So um, hopefully that's not the case. I mean, as long as I, I think the bigger issue might be if they're using that to market to you differently. Um, you know, based on your behavior of, of how you, you know, something you did uh, at, in the drive through or what you, what you did in past orders. Although I, I think, you know, companies are doing that in general anyway. You know, Amazon does it and Alibaba does it. All these big e-commerce providers do it all the time where based on what you've done before, you're buying patterns before you go to the website, you're going to get recommendations. And I think most people, the net benefit is, is there for most people, but it's that small subset that have concerns about privacy and certainly you know, if government passes laws against that, that's going to run counter to the, some of the benefits of AI or the potential benefits of AI for sure. Yeah, definitely a lot of interesting things to consider. But overall, I think it's pretty exciting and I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. Yeah, yeah, likewise. I, I don't know why you were talking about drive throughs and it made me think of driving. And yeah, this is probably a story I shouldn't share on a, on a public podcast, but I'll do it anyway. But I have this um, dark side where when there's no one around and I'm at a stoplight, if it's red and there's no cars around and no people around, I will sometimes run the red light. Um, I will just go through. <laughs> so I know it's, it's, I, I, I'm implicating myself to, to criminal activity here, but, um, but I do do that sometimes. And I always think like, I can't wait till AI becomes so prolific that AI sees that there's no cars around, there's no people around, there's no point in this light being red. So let's go ahead and make it green. And so that's, I guess that's my way of, uh, that's my way of justifying running red lights is it's just a matter of time before AI makes this green for me. So I'm just going to speed up the process here and run the red light. So please don't repeat that or tell anyone I admitted it here in public on a podcast, but that's, uh, that's what I'm really excited for AI to do to make, to make my commutes uh, a little bit faster. That's so funny because I just called my grandma the other day, actually, and she was like, I was sitting at this red light forever and I looked left and right and I was like, okay, time to go. <laughs> so that right. reminds me of my grandma, but I mean, told her probably shouldn't be doing that, but nobody tell See, anybody. Yeah. See, when you, you'll understand when you get to be my age or your grandma's age, once you're over 50, I mean, not, you know, you've got nothing to lose at that point. You start running red yeah. lights. I mean, what, what have you got to lose at that point, right? <laughs> yeah. My grandma did claim there was a sign that said you could turn on red, but there, that's not oh. a thing. So, um, yeah, I always, I, I always tell myself, uh, red lights and stop signs are more guidelines, not. And, and speed limit signs too. Speed limit signs are guidelines. They're not like hard and fast rules. It's just more like we suggest you go the speed. We suggest you stop here. But if you don't, you know that's fine too. That's my. You no, know, I feel my like everybody since moving to Denver a year and a half ago, everybody here does drive pretty fast, and I have 
gotten into the locals, I guess you could say, driving um, ways, I guess you could say. Um, so it's definitely, definitely Dran, interesting. Dran yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. In the big, bigger cities that in ever since COVID too, um, traffic has become a little bit looser too, but Anyway, we digress that we went from Taco Bell AI to me running red lights. So, and your grandma already running red lights. So we know we're really off track now. Um, but anyway, but good stuff. There's, I guess the point here, there's a lot of potential use cases for AI in addition to what Yum Brands is doing. And uh, Darian's grandma and I will appreciate someday when they also apply that to traffic patterns too. Um, so good stuff. And thanks for sharing those, those articles there. And uh, we're, we're going to get into our, our guest here, which I'm excited for too. Uh, Adam Cheatham is going to be on the show right after we take a quick break. He's going to be on to talk about phase zero implementation planning, why it's so important to digital transformations and ERP projects, and how it can actually speed up and save you time and money on your project. So you'll want to stick around for this because it's something that doesn't get discussed enough, in my opinion, within this industry. So we're going to talk about phase zero implementation planning, what it means to you, how you can apply it to your project. And then later in the show, we're going to talk about how I predict digital transformation failure and what you can do to avoid some of those things that typically lead to failure. So stick around for that. But we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Are you looking for ways to promote your product or service to enterprise technology decision makers and influencers throughout the world, like the ones who listen to this podcast? Major Tom Productions creates media, events, and influencer marketing for B2B technology providers. Our productions are exciting, educational, disruptive, and effective. Most importantly, they create results. Our content is unlike any other in this industry, engaging, influential, and trusted by technology buyers and influencers throughout the world. Each month, our productions reach hundreds of thousands of targeted buyers and decision makers who trust and engage with our honest and tech agnostic content. With long tail viral results and engagement with our content, Major Tom Productions provides a way to reach your target market and create awareness, calls to action, and a connection with potential customers. So collaborate with us today. Learn how we can feature your product or service on podcasts such as Transformation Ground Control, Journey to S4 HANA, and Journey to Dynamics 365. We can also feature your brand on our YouTube channel called Digital Transformation with Eric Kimberling, which boasts over 100,000 subscribers and over 2 million video views per year. You can also participate in our in-person events, including our Digital Stratosphere Conference. Contact us today to learn more. We can tailor a marketing campaign that works for you. We look forward to helping more people learn more about and become engaged with your brand. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Darian Fiakuski. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday by going to transformationgroundcontrol.com. And you can also view all past episodes of this podcast by going to transformationgroundcontrol.com as well. Um, the show is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. Third Stage Consulting is an independent technology agnostic consulting provider that helps clients with their digital transformations, including software selection and implementation planning and implementation itself. And speaking of implementation planning, which is one of the things we do here at Third Stage, 
we want to talk about phase zero implementation planning and what it means and what it should entail in your project and how it can help accelerate and save you time and money on your projects. And to help us unpack this topic in more detail, I, we invited Adam Cheatham, who's managing director here at Third Stage Consulting. We want to have him on the show to talk about and share his experience with helping clients through their implementation planning and phase zero activities. So with that all being said, Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me again. Always fun to be on the podcast. Yeah, it's been, um, a while, been a while since you've been on, but uh, you've been on a yeah. few times. So thanks for being here. But for those that haven't seen you before, aren't familiar with you, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, well, I've been doing a lot of phase zero work. So <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Uh, my name is Adam Cheatham. I, um, I'm in Grand Junction, Colorado on the Western Slope. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my background's in technology from a business perspective, right? So the the concept here at third stage that we really like to focus on is that business should be enabled by technology. And if the technology that you have in place is hindering your, your business from achieving its goals and objectives, then we have a problem that needs to be fixed, right? If it's a problem, then let's fix it. Uh, from a phase zero perspective, I always like to think of this as um, prep work, right? There's always work that you should do to be ready. Hmm. And people just, people want to rush in. They get approval for these massive amounts of money to spend on ERP. And they're in such a hurry to spend that money. Um, and right. that's kind of contrary to the, to the purpose of the project itself, which is to take what we're doing and transform the business in a way that emphasizes what happens after go live. You're not implementing ERP for the process of implementing ERP. There are very few people on planet Earth that like to do that. Right. <laughs> it's all about what happens afterwards. And phase zero is about preparing for that so that when you go through the point, the, the process of implementing enterprise software, you're prepared for the benefits that happen afterwards and you have launch pad for achieving them. So glad to be right. here today. I always enjoy being on the podcast. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to glad to have you again and excited to cover this topic. We don't cover it enough, probably. It's one of those topics that we talk a lot about internally at third stage. We talk about it with our clients a lot, but on this podcast and in our sort of public facing content, we don't talk about it uh, nearly enough. And I, I think it's something that's really important. I'm glad we're we're diving into it here today. Um, and a lot of the work you mentioned, a lot of the work you're doing and that we're doing at, at the company is implementation phase zero type stuff. I guess before we jump into understanding what phase zero is and what do we mean by implementation planning in phase zero, um, maybe tell us a little bit about what you do at third stage just so people understand sort of the breadth of exposure you have to our yeah. clients. Yeah, so at third stage, um, you know, my, my role as managing director is to strategically oversee all of the happenings on our, our major projects, uh, frankly on all, all our client projects. So um, if we have a project ongoing with you, there's a pretty darn good chance I know exactly who you are. So um, my role is to get involved in all, in all the bits and pieces so that we're, we're delivering the level of quality that's expected of us by our clients and by ourselves. We have a high standard at third stage and um, that's on purpose. From a perspective of what that means for phase zero readiness, that high standard is applied to walking into an implementation and a kickoff that's ready to go. You know. Um, mm-hmm. If you just sign it and the system integrator shows up on Monday, the chances that you're not ready to go are pretty high unless you spent a lot of time prior to that getting ready to go. This includes knowing where your processes are going to change, which people are going to be impacted by that, and what your core team is going to look like for your implementation. There are a lot of unknown unknowns that are going to come up during your implementation that you, you can prepare for by having a structure in place to accommodate them. Yeah, you're not going to know which which holes you're going to find and where um, until you actually find them, but you can be ready for, for how to respond to those types of challenges. And that's a big chunk of what phase zero is about. Right, right. Yeah, in fact, as we're getting into questions here, what I'm going to do real quickly uh, for the audience is I'm going to pop up on the screen a, uh, a QR code uh, for a phase zero checklist. And as we're talking through a lot of uh, what Adam and I are going to dive into here. You can you can actually scan that QR code on the screen in front of you um, to download our phase zero checklist. And we're going to dive into a lot of what you see on that checklist. We'll dive into in more detail throughout this conversation. So either right now, if you want to, you can download it or and or after we're done with this conversation or as we get through it, I'll leave it up here so you can scan it uh, throughout the conversation. But it's sort of a good follow along uh, sort of guide and something to take with you 
after the conversation here today as you're planning your your uh, phase zero initiatives for your organization. Um, and, and before I dive into my first questions here, Adam, I just want to uh, turn to the audience real quickly and look at where people are joining from today. Um, as per usual, we have people from all over the world. We've got uh, people from, or we've got someone from uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, um, sort of near where, not really, but sort of where you used to live, Adam, at least closer to, <laughs> closer to yeah. where you used to live than, than here. Um, Denver, Colorado, Indianapolis, uh, Montreal, Canada, uh, Bavaria, Germany. So thank you everyone for, for joining uh, wherever you're joining from today. And um, I guess just to, to jump in here um, as we get started, you know, what you started to describe it a little bit, but maybe if we, if we sort of back up and, and for someone that just has never heard this term phase zero, they don't really know what to expect during an implementation um, planning phase of a project. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about what exactly is implementation planning? What is phase zero? Yeah. And why is it so important to a, to a project to be successful? Yeah, well, it, um, I think of this is important in a couple of ways. And if you take it, if you strip down ERP to its most basic tenets, um, let's say that all you're doing is moving from one ERP system to, to another. Um, where let's say we are moving from um, ECC6 to SAP S400. That's about as clean of a transformation as it gets as, as it pertains to lift and shift implementation. But what you're going to be told by your system integrator in very many cases is that it's just a, it's just an upgrade, but it's, it, it simply is not, we're not upgrading software. We are changing software. And so when we think about what phase zero is, even in the simplest fashion, we're going to be changing our processes. That's kind of the point, right? Unless SAP, unless you're on SAP and you're changing just because SAP is making you, the point here is to gain some efficiencies. And even if you are moving into S4 HANA because you have to, you should be focused on the efficiencies that you're going to gain because you can recode S4 HANA in a way that just reemphasizes all of your broken processes and makes them more expensive. So let's right. look at our processes and where we expect those efficiencies to come from. And if we know where they're going to come from, we can focus on achieving them, right? We don't want that to happen by accident. The second part is who's this going to impact? If we're even if we're talking about a lift and shift, the dramatic impact on people is is going to be felt organization wide. You can change ERP and the folks that drive the forklift that will never log into the ERP that you're implementing are going to be impacted because it's going to change possibly where things are put away, uh, where they're picked from, and how it is we start thinking about restocking those types of efficiencies. So. Process and people change are really important because at the end of this implementation process, you're going to go live. You're going to want people to use this system. And if right. they're not ready for that, knowing what's coming, then you have a problem. Though They won't use it. You just spent a lot of money on something that's not going to get emphasized. So those two pieces, the technical component of it is, is a piece that you should be prepared for on, on things like infrastructure and the like. <clears throat> and these are all things that you should be planning on ahead of time so that you can create a structure for achieving the benefits that you're looking for, uh, greasing the skids that are going to be able to make things happen a little bit easier for your people and having the technology in place. The easiest part about the technology, for example, is how big of a shift is this for your data? What is the, what is the state of your data? And if you don't know that going into the implementation, you find that out six months before go live, you're not going live in six months. It's just right. as simple as that. Um, you need to know what you have to start now. And then you need to have that stuff done. And if it needs to be done before you sign a contract, then do it before you sign a contract. It, uh, those types of activities will yield benefits. The last part of it is you need to have an organization that's responsible for managing your implementation. We call it a mission control PMO at third stage. Um, but the point is that you had to have a team that does this. This isn't a one person job. It's certainly not a one person part time job on in addition to their full time job already. You're going to have a team of folks that are responsible for managing this, pulling in other people who are impacted along the way, subject matter experts that maybe own a niche part of your process and then engaging them in a way where they understand what's happening. So these are just some, some key components of how it is you, you want to be ready and what needs to be in place beforehand so that 
as, when you start your implementation, the pieces are there, the structure is there, and you're not sitting around waiting for the system integrator to send you a bill while you figure out where your footing is. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you described earlier the dynamic that often comes into play at organizations where they get the budgetary approval and they're so excited to just start spending money. And people are generally excited about the new future state, whether it's, you know, moving to SAP S4 HANA or Microsoft D365 or Oracle Fusion, whatever the new technology is you might be deploying. People are so excited that there's all this momentum and excitement that builds up that that causes people to to make mistakes early on, ironically or strangely enough. Um, not intentionally, of course, but they just want to jump in and start building stuff yeah. and, and deploying stuff without really thinking through, well, what does this mean to our business? What are we trying to accomplish? What are our business processes going to look like? How are we going to handle data? How are we going to deploy resources? All that all that stuff. And the other dynamic that we often see with clients and especially software vendors is this whole agile mentality where you, you get this mentality of, hey, let's take an agile approach and just start deploying technology without really taking the time to define processes up front because that's old school waterfall ways of deploying software and that doesn't work. So let's do agile and let's just go, we'll just build the software, we'll get feedback, we'll pivot, um, build an MVP and all that agile talk that uh, you know software vendors use. So why wouldn't a company just want to do that? Why wouldn't we just want to take a more agile approach and start deploying technology faster? Um, so I would say that it's, it's fine to take an agile approach if you don't abuse the terminology, right? Agile is not the least amount of effort to deliver the smallest, teeniest, tiniest thing because the smallest, teeniest, tiniest thing in ERP doesn't add value. So when you talk about minimum viable product, this isn't the, the smallest amount of work that I can do to get by to send you a bill. That's what agile tends to turn into in ERP because it's poorly defined and it's, and it's frankly a, a methodology that's abused. I've, I've used agile methodology for projects in the past. I'm a certified scrum master. I do believe in it, but when we start talking about what it is, this means in ERP, you have to know that this, there are no shortcuts in this. So when people are telling you, let's just get going, we're going to do an agile methodology. You can counter that with, then show me what the structure of your agile methodology is. Because agile, this still needs to be structured. It still needs to cover all of the bases. And if we're just trying to get started, this is usually code word for system integrator says, how fast, how soon can I start billing you? Mm. We're going to use agile methodology. We're going to start on Monday. We're going to figure it out along the way. It's going to be great. It's going to be fast. It's going to be flexible. And then you're going to find out that you're missing things because that flexibility without rigor is, is just a recipe for disaster. And some of our, our biggest expert witness cases right now that I've been, that I'm involved in are agile methodology without structure. And nobody knows what the requirements even are. Right. And you find them out in testing system integrator says, well, you added requirements like you're, you're right. I did because you didn't document them six months ago. Right. Uh, so this, that's a problem for me. And that's something that um, we help a lot of clients see through the difference between what agile is and what um, a bad implementation is, we say. I'm here with Adam Cheatham and we're discussing phase zero implementation planning in digital transformations. I've got a lot more to cover here with Adam. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. I recently published my first book. It's called The Final Countdown, Strategies to Reach the Third Stage of Digital Transformation. And I wrote this book because I really wanted to find a concise way to share some of my knowledge around digital strategy and how to get started on a digital transformation journey. So in this book, I cover three different sections. I cover the people, process, and technology aspects of transformation with the idea that it's meant to be a starting point, a launching pad for organizations and team members that are going through digital transformations. So I encourage you to buy this book. You can get it electronically, you can get it uh, paperback, or you can get it in hard copy as I'm holding here in front of you. You can get it by going to thefinalcountdown.com. You can also search for it on Amazon if you shop at Amazon. Otherwise, just go to thefinalcountdown.com. Love to hear your feedback uh, on this book as well. So I hope you check it out and hope you enjoy. 
I'm excited to share our newly released 2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report. This free download is available on the Third Stage website at thirdstage-consulting.com. This report is truly packed full of technology independent and agnostic insights for your project to ensure that you're strategically optimized for success. Download your copy today with the QR code in front of me or visit our website for more details. These things take time, mom and dad, they have a good life, but what am I going to do with mine? Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Darian Fiakuski. I'm also here with Adam Cheatham. We're talking about implementation planning in phase zero within digital transformations. Just as a quick reminder, you can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. The show is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. And Third Stage Consulting is an independent technology agnostic consulting provider that helps clients with their digital transformation journeys. And we have offices and team members throughout the world. So wherever in the world you're based, we can help you with your digital transformation. And be sure to reach out to us if you'd like to chat more about how we can help. So let's jump into the conversation here with Adam talking about implementation planning and phase zero. You know, there's so much so much of a tendency to to want to take that agile approach, but at the same time, it, it runs counter to what most organizations are trying to accomplish with their transformation. So when they think about yeah. their goals and objectives as a company, usually they're trying to not just get technology in the hands of users and start trying stuff. Usually it's a broader, you know, if you kind of look up at a higher level strategically, they're trying to accomplish broader goals. They're trying to standardize and create common business processes across the entire company. In a lot of cases, they want to consolidate functions, you know, move to a shared service model. They call it to where, you know, instead of having five different accounting departments throughout the world, maybe you centralize to one accounting uh, mm -hmm. process with one accounting group. And th those sorts of major changes to your organization, those major improvements you're trying to get to your organization aren't going to happen in an agile environment without taking the time to do this implementation phase zero stuff up front. Yeah. Um, but while we're talking about this, while we're on this topic, I'd love to hear from the audience, your thoughts on, you know, this is such a controversial and interesting topic, your thoughts on agile versus waterfall versus hybrid. If you're familiar with agile, if you're familiar with waterfall and you're familiar with uh, hybrid approaches, I'd love to hear in the chat, um, in the comments, just what, which you prefer, what you've seen work best. Um, so please chime in if you don't mind uh, from the audience, what you just described, not, not just in terms of how is that different than what typical software vendor or technical um, technical implementer will typically do as part of an implementation? I, I know you sort of alluded to this already, but maybe just yeah. That more. So, software vendors are in this to make money off of you, which is part of the process, right? I mean, it's we're we live in a society that makes money for in exchange for work. That's that's fine, but what you want to ask is why why so fast? It's not to your advantage to go too fast. The only person who's advantaged by getting started too fast. And so when you think about why you would want to take a step back on the concept of getting started and getting going, having your system integrator do your phase zero and those types of things, there are a whole host of reasons why you want to be careful with that approach. Uh, the first is that speed to uh, to invoicing that is the primary motivator on that you have a lot of accelerators that people will sell you hey, it's just a package something or other um that starts this a whole lot faster so all that phase zero stuff isn't necessary we, we're going to put you in a box um and it's going to work out that way that's not how that goes every single time i had talked to somebody that's like we got started too fast there's a system integrator behind that that says that we have an accelerator Right. And all that is is, a, is tens of thousands of dollars as a signing bonus is what I, it feels like to me. So um, that's thing one. Thing two, having your system integrator run your phase zero is asking somebody who has a skill set in a technical thing to do something that is not technical. Mm -hmm. Your phase zero is technical in only the ways in which you are understanding your integrations, your infrastructure, and your data, your people, your processes and your PMO are not technical in nature. They are people, process, and PMO oriented. So asking your system integrator to take care of those things is asking them to do something that they are not skilled in. So you want to have somebody who is and somebody who also understands your business in a way where you can understand 
how big of a change is this for me? That business acumen and saying, okay, this this is how this is going to be different. And then moving into who's that going to impact and how is the conversation that you need to be having in phase zero. And your system integrators are going to simply say, here is your box. Just start climbing in. And you'll right. say, well, that's not how we work. And they'll say, well, you can either get, get in the box or we can write you a bunch of custom software. Um, and then you start having a conversation that's focused on the customization, not the business process. And that's a problem too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super interesting and great points. And when you just turning the audience here, um, some interesting comments on the agile versus waterfall uh, debate. Uh, Victor on YouTube says you need to have waterfall for the overall schedule and can agile iterate within the phases. And I, I think that's uh, sort of what you're alluding to. And that's what we see a lot with, yeah. with clients, but what are your thoughts here on, on Victor's point? I love it. I think that this blended approach um, is, is a really effective one in that it allows for iteration before the damage is done. Right. It, when you go live with something, it's live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's, at that point, it's too late to iterate because you've already started causing problems and you're already behind on it. This process of this of this hybrid approach, I like a lot in that you have a conversation between the business and the development teams. It's oriented around, OK, this is how our business works today. All right. Well, that's not how the software works. And then you kind of have this conversation that gets closer and closer and closer together until you find something that fits. That way you're asking the business questions and you're drawing the technology towards you as opposed to just jumping into it for the sake of getting something, anything going um, and, and doing this a whole lot more intentionally. The best examples that I have are all oriented towards, well, that's not how our business works today. And um, in, a, uh, in a full blown agile methodology, it's like, all right, well then let's build it how your business works today. I'll build you something and then you will go live and then you can tell me what's wrong. Right. I want to tell you what's wrong in testing. And then I want you to go fix it. And then I want to see what that looks like. And then I want to tell you how it could be better. And it needs to be an iterative and collaborative conversation. So that hybrid approach is very effective with the understanding that it exists between the blueprinting and the completion of testing mm -hmm. does not exist as a part of go live. Then. That's right. the wall of all that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Makes makes total sense. And similar comment here from uh, Colin on YouTube. Colin says, I would prefer a hybrid approach considering that the implementation has at least two components, platform constructions, which is waterfall, and then system federation and migration done iteratively. So great I think that's an interesting point. And I think well, what they're both integrations. Yeah. So go ahead. I was just going to say, I think what they're both alluding to, though, is this hybrid approach where you start by doing a little bit of waterfall. You define what it is you want, what you need. You define your blueprint, mobilize resources, all the stuff you've been talking about, Adam. But then once you've done all that, and that's the key, once you've done all that, once you move out of implementation planning phase zero, that's where you can start to shift gears and say, OK, now we're going to go into an agile execution mode. But it, but yep. agile ends up going off in a million different directions that aren't typically aligned with what you're trying to accomplish strategically. Uh, unless you've done that implementation phase zero first. So, so what it does with phase zero is it gives you, it gives your agile efforts more direction. So you're going the right direction on your agile approaches. But if you skip this phase, you're going to, you know, go off in, in different random directions typically is what we find. Yeah. And, and uh, I'll use another example of the abuse of the agile methodology. If you're not talking about user stories, um, you're certainly not using agile. And if you're not talking about acceptance criteria before development starts, you're still not using agile, right? If we're writing requirements and then we're building and then we're pulling in more requirements and then we're building, this is an agile. This is an abuse of the methodology and the terminology to, uh, to simply just do work to send bills. Agile methodology requires a thoughtful user story narrative that's that you group user stories, of course, into epics. And as you start thinking about your user stories, you have your acceptance criteria. As the customer service representative, I need to be able to do A, B, and C. What that looks like as an acceptance criteria is this, that, and the other. And, I, and if I can't do these things, you haven't met my user story needs, right? It's right. A, um, 
it's different words for business requirements and systems requirements, right? A business requirement is this is, I need the, the ability to accomplish this task. The systems requirement is in order to accomplish that task, I have to write this code, that code, and the other code to build these technical capabilities. Right. Yeah, it makes total sense. And, uh, and the other thing, too, that we're alluding to here is that the time you spend doing this implementation planning phase zero work, it may sound like you're delaying the project because now you're spending the time to do this rather than going straight into the technology pieces. But really what this does, when you go through this implementation planning phase zero, it speeds things up later to where you save exponentially more time and money yeah. during the implementation than you would have if you didn't do the implementation planning phase zero. And I think that's something that a lot of people miss or, or sort of fail to understand is, well, they think, you know, it's counterintuitive, right? Why spend three or six months doing this phase zero stuff when I could be six months ahead already building the software. Well, yeah, you are six months ahead, but now it's going to take you twice as long to deploy the technology because you have no direction and you have no parameters for the project. Um, Especially when you have to call me to figure out what you did wrong. Yes. It's a lot <laughs> more I promise you. you then. That's a lot <laughs> more expensive. <laughs> it's not only more expensive, but the first thing we're going to tell you is to stop. Put your pencils down. You right. can't yeah. figure out what's going wrong if you continue to do it wrong. So um, getting it right, right up front speeds everything up. You can make some of the decisions early and identify what those are so that you can move the big, the big stuff out of the way and focus on the little stuff. It makes the little conversations easier having the big ones out of the way. And everybody is all moving to the same set of goals. It's a, yeah. if I wanted to draw, if I wanted to set out on a road trip, and I started driving in a single direction because I'm on a road trip. This is this is a journey, right? It's a transformation, whatever you want to call it. And I just start going in one direction. I could find out four or five days from now that I'm headed east and I want to go west. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's it's it's a as a simple analogy, but a lot of our clients find themselves in in that same type of conversation where we started going in this direction to find that it's entirely the wrong direction. And right. now how many months did you spend on that rushing to go the wrong direction? Right. Reminds me of that scene from uh, the movie Dumb and Dumber where they're, <laughs> they're, they're, at the, the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> they're at the gas station on their way to Colorado. They're trying to get to Aspen to meet Mary Swanson or Samsonite, whatever her name is. Um, so they're, they're way in off. the West and then they stop at the gas station and they get on the highway or they go to get on the exit, they take the wrong fork and end up going back east away from Colorado. And it takes them a day or two to realize it went the wrong way. Then they run out of gas and gas money. So I'm and not then what they, do, they sell the van to buy a scooter. They yes. trim their scope dramatically because they blew a lot of the money that they needed on the van. Yeah. Going the wrong way. And now we're stuck in a scooter. We're not going to get there nearly as fast. It's not going to be nearly as pleasant because I got to deal with the wind and all that nonsense. So I, yeah. this, this is developing to be a very good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I don't want to suggest you're dumb and dumber or that you're Lloyd or Harry from dumb and dumber if you don't do the phase zero, but it is, you know, that mistake they made, it is kind of uh, like the mistakes that organizations make when they don't do phase zero, they end up going the wrong way to your point. And then they end up having to correct later, and that ends up costing them way more time and money than if they would have just taken the time up front. I'm here with Adam Cheatham, and we're discussing phase zero implementation planning in digital transformations. I've got a lot more to cover here with Adam, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. People oftentimes ask me how I built such a strong social media following on YouTube and LinkedIn and Facebook and other outlets. And the fact of the matter is, is it took me a long time to build a following through a lot of trial and error, make a lot of mistakes. Had I known that there were companies out there that could help me build my brand, I would have done that a long time ago. I didn't know that, but the good news is that there is today a consulting firm that will help you through building your own personal brand through some of their training programs. The company is called Roloff Consulting. And if you're familiar with Emma Roloff, um, she's someone that I've had on this podcast before, and she's well known in the digital transformation space as well as the sales uh, space. And uh, she's big on TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And she and her husband have started a training course and a training company that focuses on helping people build their personal brands and helping them to sell themselves 
digitally. So whether you're a salesperson that's trying to reach more customers or you're an individual that's just trying to build your personal brand, uh, that's something that they help with through their training programs. And they've offered listeners of this podcast a free five-day LinkedIn challenge. And I encourage you to check it out. I've included a link below for this podcast. If you go to the podcast notes, you'll find a link that gets you free access to this five-day challenge where you'll get step-by-step -step guidance. Um, you'll get real results. So you'll get some tangible results from the program. And you also get a special offer at the end of it. So it's exclusive to listeners of this podcast. Be sure to check out the link below if you want to work on building your personal brand or if you're in sales and you're trying to reach more people. Whatever the case may be, check it out. Uh, it's free to listeners uh, of this podcast. You can check it out via the link below. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Darian Fiakuski. I'm also here with Adam Cheatham. We're talking about implementation planning in phase zero within digital transformations. Just as a quick reminder, you can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. The show is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. And Third Stage Consulting is an independent technology agnostic consulting provider that helps clients with their digital transformation journeys. And we have offices and team members throughout the world. So wherever in the world you're based, we can help you with your digital transformation and be sure to reach out to us if you'd like to chat more about how we can help. So let's jump into the conversation here with Adam talking about implementation planning and phase zero. You know, we could talk all day about Dumb and Dumber because I do love that movie, but um, we'll, we'll kind of shift gears and get back into the, the heart of what um, implementation planning phase zero is. And by the way, again, if you, whoops, pointing the wrong way. Right here as a QR uh, code, if you want to scan this phase zero checklist, if you haven't already, and you can kind of follow along as, as we unpack this. Um, Adam, I'm going to pull up a real quick graphic to sort of lead into this next question mm -hmm. that I have for you. But my question is, you know, what are some of the major components of uh, implementation planning in phase zero? And I'll, I'll pop this up just for a second. I'm not going to leave it up the entire time we're talking, but I'll sort of flash it up here so the audience can see it. Uh, but this yeah. is our implementation planning phase zero framework that we use as an organization um, in, in helping our clients. And there's a lot of detail behind this, but this is sort of a summary of it. Um, but maybe help us unpack some of these work streams a little bit. I'll leave it off for a second. I'll take it away. And if you forget anything, I'll put it back up. But um, what, maybe help help us get started on unpacking this uh, as we're yeah. going through. Um, so the first thing that I like about this graphic is the order in which things start in the, on the left hand side, right? So first, our executives are going to tell us what direction we're going. This is an enterprise project. It is going to impact the entire organization. So your executives better be involved and they better know which what they want out of this. This isn't something to be dictated away and assigned to the technical team to say, re-implement our ERP. There needs to be a strategy around it and it needs to create be driven in a way that creates alignment and what that means. I don't know how, um, how many organizations have been involved in where the, the CEO says, go and do this. It's the idea here is to maximize profitability through gains and efficiency. And the CFO, COO, and the sales guy all have different ideas on what that means. And so they all head in different directions and their teams head in different directions because they're following the leadership given to them. These guys are over here worried about cutting costs sales is worried about maximizing the the number of dollars that they can get committed and sales is selling things that cost a lot of money and coo is freaking out because it's not aligned and you find that out too late because the contracts are signed and now we have a problem so executive alignment is is the beginning the direction that we're going to point in are we headed east are we headed west and why so that the organization can sync up with that this will tell us where it is we expect our gains to come from, which is where operational readiness comes in. 
the process side of this, we expect this to create gains, right? That means that we expect this to change our business, which means we expect this to change our processes. So mm -hmm. let's figure out what our processes look like today. Let's figure out where we're going to make changes, where we're going to expect our benefits to come from in those efficiency gains and those effectiveness gains. And let's document the difference. <clears throat> that way we know exactly what's changing and it, at what level. Is this a small, medium, or large change in process? Then we're going to start talking about the people that are going to facilitate these changes and the new processes themselves. Start thinking about how, what the impact on them is. That people side of it, preparing people for change is required for this type of thing. To prepare them for the change, they need to know what that change is going to look like and what we expect to gain after go live. So people readiness comes next. Hmm. Now we're talking about giving them a tool to enhance their processes and enable them to adopt these new gains. That's where the technical readiness comes in, right? What tools are going away? What tools are coming in? How am I going to replace them? I know I need some of my tools to stay. That's always going to happen. That's fine. Which ones? And what, how are we going to integrate them? What does our data look like? Because when we start thinking about decision-making processes at the executive level, the data is what enables that. And if your technology doesn't actually represent the processes that you're seeking to achieve, then your data is not as useful as it ought to be. So our technical readiness is dependent on our ability to reflect our future state in a software system and then sync up with it so that our data is, is ready for that. That will also help us understand what we need to do with our data so that we can get the right pieces collected and make good decisions. Hmm. So those are the general the four tenets and pillars of how it is this is going to impact your organization. The last piece of it is making sure that these all stay tied together, not just at the beginning, but all the way through your implementation. And then frankly, through support after go live. So your project governance and your planning needs to be thoughtful and intentional so that when you build your PMO and your project core team around your implementation, you have the right people in it. They have the right structure for making decisions and they have the ability to go in and execute that structure for making decisions is one of the 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 more common pitfalls that we're finding out right and we're finding a lot of our clients fall into right now this kind of is one of our hotter themes in that <clears throat> if my team at the ground level our business process owners our global process owners don't know what decisions they can and can't make they won't make any decisions and if they don't make decisions, then we don't know how to escalate the decision-making process. You should have a team, a core team that's enabled to make decisions that are able to then know which decisions they can and can't make. Then the sponsor comes in to be able to say, all right, these are the decisions I can make based on where the tiebreakers are going to come, come, on, come from. Let's say, for example, if you have sales and ops disagreeing on what this should look like, your sponsor is going to help break that tie. But the sponsor is also going to be very good at knowing what do I need to do to escalate some of these decisions? Because at some point we need our VPs and our executives, our COO and our chief sales guy to talk this out and, and they'll make those decisions. That's OK. Sometimes our chief, our, our C-suite needs to make the decisions. And that's important because we can't break those ties ourselves in an arbitrary fashion. And they're going to be dramatically oriented towards achieving those goals at the, at the strategic and executive alignment level. So there's a lot right, that goes right. into this. This is a great framework. Um, and it's the very beginning of what it is our, our phase zero framework starts to look like. So I certainly recommend you guys um, on the line take a look at this and, and see if there are anything on here that you don't feel like you understand or have questions about because we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and just to play devil's advocate for a moment, um, let's just say I'm going to, I'm going to role play here for a second. I'm going to be a, uh, doesn't matter, SAP or Microsoft uh, sales rep here. I'm selling um, software and services. Um, and I'm going to, I'm just going to respond to what you just said. So I'm going to say, well, hey, we don't need to worry about executive alignment because you're already aligned on buying our software. So clearly you are aligned as an organization, we're good there. Um, we'll do some status reporting and stuff along the way. So we'll keep the team aligned. 
-hmm. So we're covered there. Operational readiness and the business process piece of it. We've got pre-configured best practices in our software. Don't need to worry about that. Let's move on. People readiness. We're going to do some train the trainer as part of our uh, project here. So we're good there. Move on. Don't need to do phase zero there. And then technical readiness. um, You know, you're going to replace all your systems with our technology. So that's, that's kind of a moot point. So how, how do you respond to that? Because that is the, the sort of the messaging that you, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and oversimplifying, but that's the sort of messaging you often hear from software vendors and their implementation, technical partners. Um, how do you respond to that? Or what, what do you think of that? All right. When do I get to meet my team? That's the first, right. that's the first good question. And they'll say, after you sign your contract and that's too late. Right. Right. I need to, who do I need to have on my team ready to go? Don't worry about it. We're going to handle that. Uh, you don't need to. You don't need to do any prep work. Okay, so how much time am I talking about for my for my core team? How many members of my core team do I need? We'll figure that out. Right. You should know those answers beforehand, <clears throat> because what they're telling you is they don't want you to know the hard answers yet. Because what they're going to tell you is that you need a team of six people, and they need to be dedicated full time. It's like, all right, well, I'll go hire six consultants. They say, no, they need to be six of your best. They need to be the folks that know your business inside and out and <clears throat> are capable of, of leading your organization through this change. And then you go, I know who those six people are and they have day jobs. And if I pull them from the business, we will be crippled. You want to have that conversation before or after you sign your contract and your system integrator is sending you a bill. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great That's- point. And- what ends up happening more often than not is you end up you end up in that situation like oh i need to figure out a way to free up these six people mm-hmm. that are critical to our operations that have a day job and in the meantime the software vendor the implementation partner is bringing in the technical consultants and starting to you know stockpile them on your project meter starts running so while you're trying to figure out who's going to be on your project internally and you're trying to mobilize resources get your plan sorted out and everything system integrator is already running the meter and you yeah. have to ask yourself, well, what are they running the meter? What's what, what good are they doing? What value are they adding if we're not yet involved in the project? And that's where a disconnect often times comes into play. When, and then the knee jerk reaction is, well, I can't pull those guys from the business because I didn't plan for that. So I'm going to give you the B team or, or the, or the C team. There's uh, I would rather have the system integrators C team than the client C team. Right. Cause I, yeah. the, the client's a team is the most important part of this. And when you say, well, I, now i got to put somebody on it. I need a body and a seat. So who's available? If they're available, uh, the same thing goes on the system integrator side, right? A lot of folks who are available right now that aren't working on something, they're not working on something because they're not important enough yeah, right. or high quality enough to be working on something. They got, they got moved off of it for whatever reason. That's not to say that that the A team does finish their job and become available from time to time, but the folks that are available, you need to look at more carefully for whether or not you want them on this team. And if you're reactive as a client implementing this in a space where you're putting your B, C team on it because your A team, you, you didn't plan to free them up, so you're not going to. Now you're you're diminishing the quality of your own implementation and you're diminishing the quality of your own results. Right. Absolutely. I'm here with Adam Cheatham and we're discussing phase zero implementation planning in digital transformations. I've got a lot more to cover here with Adam, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, Turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. 
The last thing you want to have happen is for your digital transformation to end up in court. I've been doing this for 20 years and I have seen everything. My name is Marcus Harris. I'm a software and technology attorney focusing my practice on drafting and negotiating software-related contracts and litigating software disputes across the country. Feel free to reach out to us at taflaw.com. We'd love to talk to you about the litigation process and what you can expect. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Darian Fiakuski. I'm also here with Adam Cheatham. We're talking about implementation planning in phase zero within digital transformations. Just as a quick reminder, you can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. The show is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. And Third Stage Consulting is an independent technology agnostic consulting provider that helps clients with their digital transformation journeys. And we have offices and team members throughout the world. So wherever in the world you're based, we can help you with your digital transformation and be sure to reach out to us if you'd like to chat more about how we can help. So let's jump into the conversation here with Adam talking about implementation planning and phase zero. So this all begs the question, this is a, a question from Darian on LinkedIn. Um, is there a typical timeline companies should expect for phase zero or is it completely dependent on each project? And, and just to back up for a second, you know, Adam, the luxury of what you and I do here at Third Stage is we both, especially you, get to see a lot of different clients because you're touching in some way all the clients that we work with at any given moment at Third Stage. Some of them are smaller, some of them are larger, and some of them are in the middle. And so you, you get to see the whole gamut. But in general, you know, how long does this take and, and how, do you, you know, how, how long can we expect for phase zero to take if we do it right? Um, so, uh, I also have the luxury of being a consultant, so I get to say that depends, um, <laughs> yeah, of course. but, um, I would say on average, this is a three to six month process. Um, and people out there are probably thinking, I got three to six months. Let's think about this though. Your selection process should be baked into this, right? And three, it, it should take you about three months to figure out what the right software package is. You're going to document your processes during that, which means that you're going to start focusing on where they're going to change. You're going to pull people into that conversation on documenting your process and selecting your ERP. This is starting into the people readiness side of things. You're going to start saying my ERP is going to replace this, that, and the other. So you're talking about technical readiness, right? You're, these are readiness activities. They happen to include the decision to choose a software, but you just need to expand your field of vision on what the software selection process is to include a lot of this. So that three months is baked in to your selection of software. Um, and if uh, somebody out there is going to say, well, I already have SAP ECC six, and I already know I'm getting SAP S4 HANA. That's a five minute conversation. Go ahead and make a hundred million dollar uh, decision on a five minute conversation. Tell me how that turns out. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm sure that somebody in your organization is going to be uncomfortable with that. So let's be diligent in this and let's get some things out of it. And that way we know we're going through that. And then you got to negotiate contracts. I promise you that um, the first offer from your system integrator is not the best one. Um, the second offer from your system integrator is not the best one. There's an iterative process in negotiating on this that will protect your organization from a terms and conditions perspective, as well as from a fiduciary perspective in that your costs will go down the more pressure you apply on your vendor and integrator. So it's going to take some time to do that, right? How many people on this on this podcast have a legal department that can make a decision in three months? <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> See, now we just, we, we're already taking this time. Right, right, right. We're already the the duration of this phase zero is already in place. So let's use it and let's do it effectively. Yeah. The other thing yeah. that I want to make sure that people also understand, and this is something that we're we're working with a number of clients on right now, is that phase zero should be done between every single phase of your transformation. You break it up into three phases. First phase is replace what's in place. Second phase is optimize. Third phase is whatever you want to call it. Um, advanced functionality, this and the other. You should do a phase zero in front of each of those because you'll learn lessons from before 
and you'll need to prepare for the next one. It's not the type of thing that you just go boom, 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 boom. This is ERP. This is enterprise software. So be careful what you do in moving too fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very very well very said well. and i think it's a, a good point that you know if you think about it from the perspective of let's just say we're looking at a 24 month horizon for the entire transformation and those listening may say okay if i've got 24 months and i spend say six months as you suggest adam i spent six months on the selection phase zero implementation planning that that only leaves me 18 months but if i skip that phase that gives me a full 24 months to actually implement and then you have to think, well, will I really implement in 24 months if I don't have a plan, if I haven't done that phase zero stuff up front? Or is it going to take me 36 months now because I'm such a mess and everything's so chaotic and I have no direction. And I'm wasting time and money along the way. It's yeah. going to take me 36 months instead of doing it in 24. And you have to think of it as a way, as, a, as the real accelerator here. Even though software vendors like to sell accelerators in the terms of prepackaged, preconfigurated technologies, I view the real accelerator is this. I mean, phase zero implementation yep. planning is the accelerator to a faster, cheaper implementation. And that's the way I think people need to shift their minds and how they think about it. Yep. One, uh, I think that the most important part of all of that is that before you do all of the work and plan fully execute an entire integrated program plan, your implementation timeline is an imaginary number. Yeah. So it's going to take me 24 months. Who knows? You could be right. You could be 100% wrong. But if it's going to take you 24, if 24 months is the actual number, if you started today, it would be faster if you spent your three to six months and you might be able to do it in 12 to 18, right? Like right. this, we're talking about getting things in order and, and sequencing them in an appropriate fashion that it happens the most effective way. It, uh, for those of you out, out there working production, Somebody sends you an order for a thousand widgets and you just start building them. What did you miss? The whole production planning cycle, right? You could build sub assemblies that uh, need to be deconstructed to be able to put back together in the full finished goods assembly. If you just start building components, you may find that some of them need to be taken apart to put it to put the whole thing together. And what does that do? It takes more time. It requires rework and that's how this gets sped up in, in the planning cycle. Yeah. yeah it, and speaking of building stuff, I, another good analogy, I think that, that people can get their arms around is, is, you know, you think about building a house or building any sort of building. Um, here, there's two, two ways to approach it. There are two, two possibilities to, to illustrate this point. One would be, you could, um, you could start with a blueprint and an architecture make sure you've got alignment on what exactly it is you're going to build and you've got customer sign off that this is exactly what we're going to build. Then you start working with all the subcontractors to do all the different things per a project plan. That's sort of the intuitive way that is commonly understood to be the right way to build a building. The other option, which unfortunately is what most organizations do with their digital transformations or ERP projects is you sort of skip the blueprinting, you skip the architecture, you, you, you bypass the general contractor, and you just start calling plumbers and electricians and framers and roofers and other subcontractors to come in and start building stuff. And imagine what would happen if you did that without any sort of blueprint or any sort of vision for the project. Now, the plumber may tell you, don't worry about it. Um, I know exactly how to build plumbing. I've got a pre-configured way that I can build plumbing, but plumber doesn't know, is this a two-story house? Is this a ranch? Is it a three-story house? Is it a townhome? What, what is it and how exactly is it designed? Um, and that's a lot like what organizations end up doing is they end up calling the plumbers and the framers and the roofers and everyone without having done all that upfront work. And they wonder why the project takes so long and why they're not getting what they want out of it. And yeah. if you think of it in the terms of building a physical house or a physical building, it, it's it's the same same mentality or the same thing. Yeah, let's run the wiring and the plumbing before the drywall goes up and before they blow the insulation in. Because if after, after all of that happens, now they're saying, oh, you want to put an outlet there? Well, <laughs> right. the corpus wiring is 20 feet away, and we got to go through all that insulation that we blew in. We got to like it's it, yeah. We've got to yeah, we've got to move the we've got to move yeah. the kitchen because the plumbing was done a different way than what you think, yeah. and so we've got to move the kitchen into a different part of the yeah. part of the building. And that's what yeah. you end up doing with these projects is you end up the plumber in this case in this analogy is the system integrator or the software vendor. You've called yeah. the plumber and now the plumber is coming in trying to build plumbing and you haven't done all the other work and plan for all the other work that needs to happen outside of what the yeah. software vendor and the, pl and the plumber is going to do. 
Yep. And then your system integrator is going to say, look, it's all prefab. We're not worried about that. We're going to show up. We're going to, we got big chunks that we're just going to, we're just going to, all we got to do is screw them together. Right. Right. Well, what if I don't want the kitchen there? What if my right. business requires my kitchen to be closer to the garage so that I, it's faster for me to take the trash out? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Those types of things. I'm here with Adam Cheatham and we're discussing phase zero implementation planning in digital transformations. I've got a lot more to cover here with Adam. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear? If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting and your host of Transformation Ground Control. I want to encourage you to read our Guide to Organizational Change Management. It's a free report or free guide that we published. It's one that I actually wrote that talks about best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. So as you know, on this podcast, we cover a lot of stuff related to the human sides of change, organizational change management, including training, communications, org design, all kinds of stuff as it relates to change management. So if you're trying to learn more about change management, or you're looking for more direction and ideas on how to get started on your change management strategy and your overall journey, be sure to check out this guide. You can read it by scanning the QR code on the screen in front of you, or in the links below for this particular podcast episode, you can find a link to uh, take you to the page that'll allow you to register to go ahead and download that and read it for free. So be sure to check it out. It's the guide to organizational change management uh, written by yours truly. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think and hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Darian Fiakuski. I'm also here with Adam Cheatham. We're talking about implementation planning and phase zero within digital transformations. Just as a quick reminder, you can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. The show is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. And Third Stage Consulting is an independent technology agnostic consulting provider that helps clients with their digital transformation journeys. And we have offices and team members throughout the world. So wherever in the world you're based, we can help you with your digital transformation. And be sure to reach out to us if you'd like to chat more about how we can help. So let's jump into the conversation here with Adam talking about implementation planning and phase zero. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a question from um, Serge on LinkedIn. He says, "Is there are there any tools you use for strategic business process deeper dives? At what level should the processes be mapped?" Yeah, we use a, uh, we've got a really very good business process management tool that we use at Third Stage to help with this. But the the um, and and Eric, you you're better at that that one than I am, uh, just because you're closer to it. But from a perspective of what levels is that um, that's an iterative conversation, right? To make a decision on what software I need and what processes are going to change, we're probably talking level two, maybe level three, right? When we get into the blueprinting phase, we're going to get down into greater detail, level three, level four, level five. And that's when we start really coding software and building around that. So yeah. they need to be mapped at the level five um, as you're going through the design and build phase of your implementation you want that step by step especially for tools like microsoft dynamics and s4 hana because they do require you to know exactly how you are going to build every single field and in what way so you do need to get down to that level eventually when we're talking phase zero a uh, level two level three is sufficient um, because if you get farther down to that, you begin to dictate the solution. And when you get into dictating solution, you start to build it the way that it's run today. And now we have a problem because we're not yeah. looking to do what we do today. So we yeah. do have a very good business process management tool 
um, that that uh, we help use to help our clients in identifying what processes are going to change. What processes do they know? Do they have that they don't? Nobody's using. You know those right. those types of things. So yeah, and and for those that don't know or haven't heard that nomenclature before phase or, or I'm sorry, level one to level five business process mapping. Level one is your real high level macro processes, sort of your end to end processes. So it'd be like um, capture customer requirements would be one step. Create customer order would be a second step, really high level. It's not telling you how to do it. It's not giving you any sort of real detail, but it's sort of just sort of that macro process. And then level two gets into a little bit more detail all the way on down to level five. And by the time you get to level five, that's where you're saying, I'm going to this screen, I'm filling out this field, I'm choosing these options, and you're getting super granular within the technology down at level five. Now, the problem with what software vendors will say is they'll say, don't worry about phase zero business process mapping because our software has the business processes baked within it. Well, the problem is they're talking down at level five and at level five, you can be making a ton of different decisions at that granular level. The software is very flexible, generally speaking. So you've got to know how are we starting at the top level and then how are we going to work our way down to level five and that's where business process management tools can help by getting that sort of business architecture in place first so that regardless of what technology you deploy this is what we want our business to look like then as you get past phase zero into implementation that's where you get into level three four five with the software vendor and with the technical partners to define what levels three four and five look like more at the process the detailed processing workflow level so i think that's a good way to think about it. And I, I like the word iterative because it is iterative. You're not going to do it all in phase zero, but you are going to get down to level two, maybe three in phase zero and use that as your blueprint for how you're going to um, lead into the implementation. And by the way, by doing all this phase zero stuff, including the business process mapping, it puts you, the customer in charge of the project. So now suddenly you're in control. You're the one dictating how this is going to look and how it's going to affect your business rather than just assuming technical vendor is going to have all the answers based on how they typically deploy technologies. Yeah. So um, good stuff. So here's a question that um, I imagine some people might be thinking on this call or on this uh, interview listening in, but what if you're already past phase zero? What if I'm on a project and I, I've already gotten deep into the technical implementation and I look at and listen to everything you've just said, Adam, about what you should do in phase zero and I panic a little bit and say, uh oh, I haven't done half that stuff or, you know, two thirds of that stuff that you just described, but yet I'm already well into this project. What advice do you have? Like, should I stop, go back into do phase zero? Should I start to pepper in pieces of phase zero as I go? Or how, how do you suggest handling that? Yeah. And that's, that's a difficult question to answer because at the end of the day, um, the question is, how was it going? And in some cases, you, you might be one of the lucky few that, that yeah, you know what, it's actually going fairly well. We, uh, we picked the right software by accident and it fits our business perfectly. Um, and so we're, we're right on track. And if that's you, congratulations, like not you know, good, you know, well done. Um, maybe, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. um, but if it's not like, I don't know how, um, how many times we called, look, there's, Something doesn't feel right. I can't put my finger on it. We're halfway through this. Uh, whether we, whether you did phase zero or not, to be entirely honest, uh, it just doesn't feel right. Um, trust your instincts on that and get a second opinion too. Um, a lot of our, you know, we're we're not afraid to tell clients, look, you're you're just fine. Uh, this is hard. It's and and it feels hard because it is hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so stay the course, um, you know, make sure you got your quality assurance. Uh, so as a third party that can tell you, all right, you are drifting a little bit. Um, but sometimes we say that and that's fine. We got no problem being upfront and honest, but at the same time, lots of times your gut is going to be a hundred percent accurate that something's wrong. And so we'll come in and we'll figure out how to diagnose that and then be able to tell you, all right, this is where these changes need to be made. This is how you can improve. And this is what you should do. We do mostly come into these types of things and we let the implementation continue on unless somebody tells us, look, there are fires everywhere. It's all on fire. Then it's like, okay, right. then stop lighting matches. Uh, <laughs> um, so we will sometimes say, look, yeah, you, um, at first glance, you guys are, um, in trouble. So stop everything. 
But we also understand that stopping an implementation at a, on a global scale is hard to do and costs money. Idle time costs money. So we're fully aware of that. So when we say that, it's because we have to. Most of the time, it's uh, um, we can come in four to eight weeks, depending on the level of urgency and how much information we need to get into and say, what's wrong? What's going on here? Four weeks is really fast, to be fair. Um, a lot can happen in four weeks, but a lot is certainly not going to happen in four weeks. And the level of detail that we can get to in eight is certainly not just double. It's more. It's it's an exponentially larger because the, the findings start to create a, a higher level of quality. But if if we need to stop, we need to stop. Don't be afraid to do that because keeping going will cause more damage. So right. think about where you are and, and ask for a second opinion from a professional. Just like you go to the doctor, right? Man, you know what? I just don't feel right today. Um, some days you're gonna say that's normal. I don't feel right. Maybe I had too much to drink last night. <laughs> right. Something like that. I know exactly what's going on here, and I deserve it. Um, or I don't feel right. Um, you know, I'm, my vision's blurry. Uh, my chest hurts. These are things you should go to the doctor for. And maybe they'll tell you, yeah, you know what? Um, you're going to be fine. Or you need to see a specialist and you need to make some changes to your lifestyle. And that's okay. You want to find those things out early rather than when it's too late. And right before go live is too late. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, totally agree. And uh, yeah. And just again, as a reminder, this uh, checklist right here, if you're watching, you can scan this checklist to get the phase zero checklist. If you're listening on an audio only platform and you, you don't see the QR code, you can also go to the links in the, in the description below in the notes for this podcast episode. Um, but just to, sort of wrap this all up and, and give us some guidance on how to how to move forward here, Adam. How do we get started on this process? I know we've got the phase zero checklist. You can download it here. We've got the slide and sort of the visual that sort of hopefully gets us a little bit grounded in terms of what it is we should do it in phase zero. But beyond that, what, what do you recommend to organizations that are early in their journeys or midstream and trying to figure out how to fit this phase zero stuff into their project? How do, how do you recommend they get started there? Um, you start with your executive alignment and your vision and your objectives and ask how that's going. That's That'll be your first gut check, right? Just, let's gauge the wind direction on this. Um, are we? Do we all think we're actually saying the same thing? Or um, are we going to get all of our executives in the room and fight to the death? Uh, <laughs> right. Um, if, if it's the latter, then you're, you got a bigger problem on your hands. But um, you know, just start with that. Are we headed in the direction that we said we wanted to? And then um, on that same graphic, I, I believe in the start in the upper left, going left to right and top to bottom, right? Get your executive alignment working and then start talking about your processes. Do we know where we're going to change? Have we identified any of those areas? And are we creating resistance by saying that's not how we do business today? Um, right. To a certain extent, I want to know how you do business today. To a certain extent, I don't. I want to know how you're doing business tomorrow. What does that look like? And then start kind of going down that list and, and piecing it together. And um, I do want to uh, also answer Serge's question there, too. Is it possible to have a good software selection level one, level two? You need to get to level two. Um, that's important as well. So, Right. Right. I'm having trouble with the, the, the camera now that uh, I messed with the sharing the, uh, the slide there. There we go. Um, well, good. I, I think that's great advice and uh, appreciate appreciate you being here today. I, I yeah. um, think it's a, it's a great topic. It's not talked about enough or discussed enough in this industry. So hopefully it's helped the audience here understand uh, just what phase zero is and how they might factor that into or incorporate that into their overall digital transformation or ERP project. Um, again, as a, as a takeaway, uh, check out this phase zero checklist right here to scan the QR code, go to the links below in the description field. If you can't scan that or don't want to scan that, um, use that as a starting point or a reference guide. And, uh, as always, you can reach out to either Adam or I, or go to third stage dash consulting.com, uh, to learn more about us, how we can help. And you can contact us and set up a time to chat and brainstorm ideas, um, on the website there. So I've included our, our contact information in the, uh, description below as well. All right. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to the audience for the great questions. They're really interesting topic, something that uh, hopefully you've got value out of and 
and now understand how we can save time and money by spending more time on the implementation phase zero or implementation planning phase zero component of a digital transformation or ERP project. Um, we've got a lot more to cover. We're going to debrief that conversation a little bit here with Darian here in, in a second, and then we're also going to get into um, how I predict digital transformation failure. We're going to close out the episode with that, so be sure to stick around for that. First, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. People oftentimes ask me how I built such a strong social media following on YouTube and LinkedIn and Facebook and other outlets. And the fact of the matter is, is it took me a long time to build a following through a lot of trial and error, make a lot of mistakes. Had I known that there were companies out there that could help me build my brand, I would have done that a long time ago. I didn't know that. But the good news is that there is today a consulting firm that will help you through building your own personal brand through some of their training programs. The company is called Roloff Consulting. And if you're familiar with with Emma Roloff. Um, she's someone that I've had on this podcast before, and she's well known in the digital transformation space as well as the sales uh, space. And uh, she's big on TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And she and her husband have started a training course and a training company that focuses on helping people build their personal brands and helping them to sell themselves digitally. So whether you're a salesperson that's trying to reach more customers or you're an individual that's just trying to build your personal brand, uh, that's something that they help with through their training programs. And they've offered listeners of this podcast a free five-day LinkedIn challenge. And I encourage you to check it out. I've included a link below for this podcast. If you go to the podcast notes, you'll find a link that gets you free access to this five-day challenge where you'll get step-by-step -step guidance. Um, you'll get real results. So you'll get some tangible results from the program. And you also get a special offer at the end of it. So it's exclusive to listeners of this podcast. Be sure to check out the link below if you want to work on building your personal brand or if you're in sales and you're trying to reach more people, whatever the case may be, check it out. Uh, it's free to listeners uh, of this podcast. You can check it out via the link below. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate experience and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. This is Eric Kimberling. I'm with Darian Fiakuski, and we just had um, Adam Sheetham on the show. We were talking about implementation planning and phase zero planning for digital transformations and ERP projects. And uh, Darian, what were some of your thoughts or takeaways from that conversation with Adam? Yeah, I think it was a great conversation overall. I think one of my favorite parts of the conversation was definitely the analogy that you guys brought up from the Dumb and Dumber movie. I thought that actually worked out to be the perfect analogy with um, how they had to sell the van and then it was more expensive. Just exactly like how if somebody goes with and skips over phase zero and goes completely the wrong way and then like Adam said, it ends up being a lot more expensive in the long run anyways. So you might as well just go through it and go the right way. Um, in the beginning. So I really liked that part of the conversation. I thought that provided some really clear insight into how you can compare it to maybe a movie or I guess you could say like real life things. So yeah, yeah. And it, you know, even though it's a funny, humorous take on it, it is, it is sort of representative of what a lot of companies do. They get on the wrong on ramp, head the wrong direction. And two, three days later, they realize that they're not going to Colorado. In the case of the analogy, they're back in Kansas in the middle of the plains, in the middle of nowhere. And they, you know, they make in the movie, if you haven't seen it, or if you don't remember, there's some funny scenes where they start talking about how, I, I can't repeat the language because I think they, there's some foul language in this part, but where they're talking about how John Denver was lying, basically, when he was talking about Colorado being so pretty. And they're complaining that this is not pretty because they're in the middle of Kansas, the plains of Kansas. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of funny humor behind it, but it is, tr it, it does, it did, I don't know why it just sort of triggered that thought when Adam was talking about that. It did remind me of that scene where they just went the completely wrong direction and organizations do it all the time is, even though that's just a movie in, in reality, organizations do that exact thing. And to your point, they end up spending a lot more, or to Adam's point too, they end up spending a lot more time and money just fixing the problem now 
buying this, you know, trading the van for the scooter and running out of gas money and all the debacles that come along with that if you haven't seen the movie. So next time you watch Dumb and Dumber, you can always think of this podcast and you can think about digital transformation. Um, so you're welcome for that in advance. Um, well, good. Well, that, that was a, a good uh, conversation. Enjoyed having Adam on. And now we're going to dive into how to predict digital transformation failure. And this is a video that actually recently premiered on my YouTube channel. And it's a, a, a brief clip we're going to play for you right now. And it talks about the things I look for and that our team looks for at Third Stage Consulting. When we're helping clients, when we see these signs, we know that it's likely going to lead to failure. And certainly if you have a combination or all of these signs building up within your project, chances are very high you're going to experience failure. And we tell you this not to say, hey, you're going to fail, but we tell you this to say, hey, look at these things. And if you're doing any of these things, let's find a way to not do those things and do things a little bit differently to ensure you're on a different path towards success. So with that all being said, let's roll the clip here of uh, my recent YouTube video of how I predict digital transformation failure. Not many people know this, but it turns out that I can predict the future, at least as it relates to digital transformation failure. But how exactly do I do it? I'm gonna share my secrets here today. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their digital transformation journeys. And in addition to helping clients select and implement different types of enterprise technologies, I also have the good fortune of being able to help organizations fix a failure. And in some extreme cases, I also testify in courts in cases where there's a lawsuit involving an enterprise technology failure. So in all this breadth of experience, I get a lot of exposure. My team and I get a lot of exposure to failures and what causes failure and also what causes success. And the good news with all this experience is that there are some pretty simple things that organizations can do to predict failure and avoid failure. And so what I want to do today is talk about the five things that I look for and that I watch for that indicate to me that the project is going to fail. And this is how I predict the future. As I look at these five patterns, and if I see any combination of these five patterns, I know with pretty good certainty that that project is going to fail. Before we dive too far into today's content, I want to invite you to learn a little bit more about Third Stage Consulting, who we are and what we do. I've included a link to a video right here that describes Third Stage in a bit more detail. It talks about our story, our history, our philosophy, our clients, our service offerings, and that sort of thing. But in general, what Third Stage Consulting does is we're an independent and tech agnostic consulting provider. We help clients through their entire digital transformation life cycles, beginning with digital strategy, software evaluation and selection, all the way through and including implementation planning, implementation readiness, and the actual implementation itself. We're technology agnostic, so we only represent our clients' best interests. We do not represent software vendors. But having said that, we work very closely with software vendors, all the leading players that you can imagine we've worked with both in helping clients evaluate and select them, but also in helping clients implement those solutions as well. So we have a very broad, objective, agnostic view of the market that is meant to really represent your interest as you go through your digital transformation. I also encourage you to scan this QR code right here to get access to our resource center. This resource center has a ton of information, a ton of eBooks that are free. You have access to top 10 software rankings, playbooks for how to make your project more successful, guides to change management, YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff that are gonna help you through your digital transformation. So I encourage you to scan this QR code to get access to those resources. And please feel free to reach out to me directly to brainstorm ideas about your project. Even if it's just informally, you wanna bounce around some ideas and get some informal advice, I'd be happy to spend some time with you. So feel free to reach out to me. I've included my contact information below. You can also find it in the description field of this video as well. So the first thing I look for that tells me whether or not a project is going to succeed or fail is the clarity of vision for the overall organization and for the digital transformation itself. What I look for is I try to understand how well aligned and defined is the digital transformation strategy with the overarching goals and objectives of the organization. If it's an organization that doesn't have very good clarity on their strategic direction as an organization as a whole, that tells me that project is likely to fail no matter how well the project is managed. Reason being is that that lack of clarity and that lack of understanding by the rest of the organization is going to create difficulty to be successful in any sort of digital transformation. Even if an organization has a clear vision and strategy for themselves as a whole, if they haven't articulated and connected the dots between overarching strategy and digital strategy, then that project is likely to fail as well. And the reason for that is because what happens is an organization has its strategic goals and objectives up here at a high level, and then down here at the digital strategy and the digital transformation execution level, project teams are often guessing as to what direction to go. 
So when they make day-to-day decisions on how to customize the system or how to configure the system, how to define a business process or a workflow, the scope of the project, which modules to purchase or include in scope, how to change people's jobs. There's tons of different decisions that need to be made as part of a digital transformation. And if you don't have clarity as to how your digital strategy and your digital transformation project is going to support the overarching goals and objectives of the organization, you're going to be shooting in the dark. You're going to be flying blind, guessing as to what you need to do to make the project successful. And unfortunately, guessing doesn't get the job done, and it almost ensures that your project is going to fail. So if you don't have clarity of vision, that's one thing that tells me that your digital transformation or ERP implementation is highly likely to fail. Another failure factor I look for in digital transformations and ERP implementations is the organization that chooses the software they want. They sign a big contract with the software vendor and the implementation partner, and they just jump right in, bring the army of consultants on board, and they start deploying new technologies. Without having done a proper and a thorough implementation planning and a sort of phase zero to your implementation, you're likely to fail because your organization and your team is not ready. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what the blueprint for the organization is going to be in the future. You don't know how you're going to mobilize resources, and you probably don't even fully understand what your implementation plan and budget really is. Your software vendor may have given you a high-level estimate or some sort of a proposal for one work stream within the overall digital transformation, which is the, the software work stream. But it's highly likely that they did not tell you what it's going to take to change your business processes, to change your organization, to define the architecture and the integration between your legacy systems and the new systems. All those different things need to be defined in detail during the phase zero implementation planning. Now, software vendors might tell you, yeah, yeah, we got it. We're going to do that for you. Well, they're not going to do it for you. What they're going to do is ask you the questions they need to design and configure software. But what you need as part of your digital transformation to be successful is to define how your business is going to look in the future. What do you want to be when you grow up? What's your future state operating model? How are you going to be organized in the future? What are the expected business benefits? How are you going to mobilize your internal team? And if you don't have all this stuff ready by the time you start the implementation with your vendor and your implementation technical partners, you're highly likely to fail in those cases. And one thing we found is that organizations that invest the time and resources and effort into their phase zero implementation planning are going to save exponentially more time and money later on, more so than if they would have just jumped straight into the implementation and gotten started right away. The next thing I look for to determine whether or not a project is going to fail is the organizational change strategy. If an organization has a digital strategy that entails a change strategy that only covers basic training and communications, I know that project is probably going to fail. And the reason for that is because today's technology is so disruptive to organizations that training and basic communications is not enough. If you wait until end user training to really get into the weeds of how people's jobs are going to change and what their roles are going to look like going forward, then you've waited too long. People are going to panic. They're going to push back. And you might as well get that out of the way as early in the project as possible. And the best way to get that out of the way as early as possible is to make sure you have a robust and a complete organizational change plan. Now, I'm not going to dive into organizational change strategies and give you any specific tips at this point. But what I can do is point you to this playlist right here that covers everything related to organizational change management. It's all the YouTube videos I've done that covers anything to do with change management. So if you check that playlist right here, it'll dive into more detail as far as what you should do and how to define an organizational change strategy. But suffice to say, the organizations that don't invest in change management are the ones that are highly likely to fail. And in fact, every expert witness engagement that I've been involved with, and there's been about 50 or more so far in my career, every single one of those has failed to invest in effective organizational change management. And that is the number one most common pattern among the 50 or so expert witness cases that I've had to analyze, write reports for, and testify for. Another thing I look for to determine whether or not a project is going to fail is the balance of power between the client, the end customer, and the implementation vendors. Software vendor, system integrator, implementation technical partner, VAR, whatever you call them, the people that focus on the software implementation. If that balance of power is off to where the vendors and or the implementation technical partners have too much power, then chances are extremely high that your project is going to fail. And the reason for that is because at this point, it becomes their project, not your project. They're going to create a solution that they might feel comfortable with, but probably isn't going to work for your business unless you tell them what it is you need and you have clear direction and clarity 
and parameters around what the project is going to look like and what the end results are. Instead, what organizations need to do is they need to take control and ownership of the project and at the very least be on even footing with the system integrator or the outside vendors. And this is a very difficult thing to quantify, but I can tell by looking at a project whether or not there's the appropriate balance of power and the appropriate investment in the project compared to the client and the vendors. And if you have a clarity around how you want your project to look, if you've done the phase zero implementation planning that I've talked about before, that's going to give you a tool set to be able to manage the system integrator and to manage your software vendor rather than the software vendors managing you. And once you take control and you start to manage the project and you define your future state, you define how technology is going to support your business going forward, you make more of the critical decisions around how you're deploying new changes to your organization, the more likely it is you're going to be highly successful in that case. Now, the problem is, is for those of you that are going through transformations, oftentimes that's not your main business. Your core business is something completely different, and you only go through these projects hopefully every 10 or 20 or 30 years. So you do need outside experts, but you don't want to be so dependent on them that you have this sort of learned helplessness to where you defer everything to them. So instead, it's important to make sure that you take the time to have that roadmap and clarity so that you can manage the experts that come in to provide the technology competencies that you need. Now, the final thing I'll talk about here today that determines whether or not a project is going to fail is whether or not the organization has realistic expectations for their transformation. Those organizations that have unrealistic expectations are extremely likely to fail. The reason for that is because they have no idea what they're getting themselves into. They have no idea how much time and money they're about to spend, but they're guessing and they're assuming that that guess is right and it is rarely, if ever, correct. Organizations that have unrealistic expectations also face the problem of making really bad decisions later on as they try to make decisions to force fit the overall project into an unrealistic timeline, scope, budget, etc. And that leads to a bunch of downstream problems later on. For example, we worked with clients that had started their project with completely unrealistic expectations. They had timelines and budgets that were never going to happen, but then they start making decisions to try and force the transformation into that timeline and that budget. So because it won't fit the way they originally thought, they start cutting things. They start cutting rounds of integration testing. They start cutting some of the organizational change activities. They start assuming that they're not going to redefine their business processes. They're just going to implement technology to do things the same way they've always done them because it's easier and faster that way in the short term. So those are just a few examples of how organizations end up making bad decisions later on that compound the problem that started back in the very beginning when they had those unrealistic expectations, which is why it's so important that you take software vendor proposals and estimates for time, budget, and resources. You have to take those with a grain of salt because they're trying to sell you software and you need to be realistic about what it's really gonna take for your project. And not only that, software vendors are trying to convince you that they can deploy technology, but again, your goal is to deliver a business and digital transformation to your organization, and those are two very different things, two very different plans, and two very different resource and budget allocations. So if you go in with realistic expectations, you're not guaranteed success, but you've eliminated one of the biggest risk factors that lead to digital transformation failure. Now, for more information on how to make your digital transformation successful, I encourage you to download our ebook called Lessons from 1000 Digital Transformations. This provides a number of lessons that will help you through your digital transformation, and you can download that for free on our website. You can scan the QR code right here, or you can go to the links below. So that's a quick video demonstrating and, and sharing my thoughts on how we predict digital transformation and ERP implementation failure amongst our clients. Uh, we've got some other thoughts and comments and questions we're going to get to as it relates to that same topic. We're going to get to that here in just a moment, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling, and I'm the CEO and founder of Third Stage Consulting. Before we dive too far into today's content, I want to invite you to learn a little bit more about Third Stage Consulting, who we are and what we do. We help clients through their entire digital transformation life cycles, beginning with digital strategy, software evaluation and selection, all the way through and including implementation planning, implementation readiness, and the actual implementation itself. We're technology agnostic, so we only represent our clients' best interests. We do not represent software vendors. But having said that, we work very closely with software vendors, all the leading players that you can imagine we've worked with both in helping clients evaluate and select them, but also in helping clients implement those solutions as well. So we have a very broad objective agnostic view of the market that is meant to really represent your interest as you go through your digital transformation. I also encourage you to scan this QR code right here to get access to our resource center. 
this resource center has a ton of information, ton of eBooks that are free. You have access to top 10 software rankings, playbooks for how to make your project more successful, guides to change management, YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff that are gonna help you through your digital transformation. So I encourage you to scan this QR code to get access to those resources. And please feel free to reach out to me directly to brainstorm ideas about your project. Even if it's just informally, you wanna bounce around some ideas and get some informal advice, I'd be happy to spend some time with you. So feel free to reach out to me. I've included my contact information below. You can also find it in the description field of this video as well. The last thing you want to have happen is for your digital transformation to end up in court. I've been doing this for 20 years and I have seen everything. My name is Marcus Harris. I'm a software and technology attorney focusing my practice on drafting and negotiating software related contracts and litigating software disputes across the country. Feel free to reach out to us at taflaw.com. We'd love to talk to you about the litigation process and what you can expect. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 166. My name is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting. Third Stage is an independent tech agnostic consulting firm that helps clients with their digital transformations throughout the world. And uh, you can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. It's produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage. So, uh, Darian, we just shared this video clip from my YouTube channel about how we predict digital transformation failure. What were some of your questions or comments from that video? Yeah, I mean, from this YouTube video, again, I think it just reiterates how important phase zero planning is. I know you talked about that in the video um, and why it's so crucial for businesses to really plan in that phase zero point before the project even gets started. But one question I had was if, or yeah, for you that if you could discuss further the concept of power balance between clients and the implementation vendors, how can organizing organizations maintain control of ownership of their projects when this power balance may be off? Great question. And actually, I would tie it back to part of my answer. I would tie it back to the conversation with Adam earlier in this episode where we talked about the phase zero implementation planning. That is one way, one of the best ways to equip yourself with power and control. And I'm not saying this in sort of a power hungry, control freak sort of a way. I'm saying it because you as an organization need to own and uh, have ownership of your digital transformation. It shouldn't be your software vendors or your technical consultants that are making major business decisions for you. They can give you advice. They can suggest to you how the software works or how it can support your business, but ultimately you have to be the one to decide how you want your business to run in the future. And by doing this implementation phase zero stuff, um, you're gonna end up having a better blueprint, a better vision, and it puts you in sort of the general contractor seat now rather than someone who's just sort of helpless, helplessly relying on a technical vendor to tell you what may or may not work with their technology. Um, it's also a way for you to take ownership in terms of, of managing budget and managing, um, you know, managing the timeline and overall plan. The other thing I think that's a great way to equip yourself or to arm yourself to put you on even footing with your, with your partners or your, your technology providers is to upskill yourselves as much as you can, educate your team, learn as much as you can about digital transformation, you know, watch podcasts like this, go watch YouTube videos, go take training courses to learn about digital transformations in general, about change management, program management, things like that. But also, you know, the more you can do to learn the technology that you're deploying. So if you're implementing, you know, Microsoft D365 or Epic or Info or, um, you know, SAP or whatever the product is, you know, go learn the product, go get as many of your people as you can to go learn the product so that they don't necessarily become experts overnight because they're not going to, and they're not going to be as knowledgeable probably as your software vendor and your technology implementer, but they can at least speak the same language and sort of understand what is happening. And again, it, the whole idea here is to avoid that learned helplessness that comes with, I don't know the software technology provider does. So technology provider just needs to do this all for me. And that creates a really unhealthy, weird dynamic within organizations when that happens. So one of the best ways you can counter that, though, is to educate yourselves and train yourselves and, and have a better idea of, of what you're doing. And that gives the organization a lot of confidence, too, to be able to, to take ownership of the project. Yeah, definitely. I want to kind of switch gears, I guess you could say, um, with this next question. But it's you mentioned the importance importance of data and AI for digital transformations. Can you explain how the data um, plays a role in ensuring the success for people in their projects or digital transformation? Yeah. So, you know, on one hand, um, 
you know, data is a good way to, to uh, enable some emerging technology capabilities like artificial intelligence or predictive analytics or business intelligence. So, so by having good data, you're able to use tools like artificial intelligence or some of the predictive planning tools that take historic data and predict the future or make recommendations based on what it sees in the data. If your data is dirty or if you don't have complete data, then that limits the benefit or the appeal or the usefulness of those, those sorts of tools. Um, but even more fundamental than that, even if you set that aside and say, well, that's just sort of a nice to have that we'll get to in the future. Um, if you want to run your business and have clear, accurate, real-time visibility into what's happening in your business, you have to have clean data and you've got to have a good data management process to ensure that as people are touching data within systems, as they're entering data and transacting data and moving data around and manipulating it or whatever, you have to make sure they're doing it in a way that's consistent, repeatable, and accurate. So you're not corrupting the data or you're not making mistakes that then, you know, create mistakes with your reporting and your understanding of what's really happening in the business. So data migration is super important, just really fundamentally speaking in terms of just getting technology to work and getting uh, realistic visibility into your business. And it's just as maybe even more important when you start thinking about artificial intelligence and emerging technologies that are so dependent on, on good data. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good things that you can learn from that video and this podcast from, from how to predict failure and potentially avoid it for your digital transformation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and hopefully uh, the audience found that helpful and uh, be curious to hear from the audience too what you think some of the indicators of failure are or any, any feedback you have on the things we talked about there as it relates to predicting failure. So um, good stuff. Well, well, thank you uh, to the audience for the great questions. Thank you to our guest, Adam Cheatham, for being here. Thank you, Darian, for, for co-hosting uh, as you typically do. And uh, as a reminder, you can find new episodes of this podcast every Wednesday. You can also go uh, watch past episodes. If you just cannot wait until next Wednesday, until the next episode comes out, don't fear. You have 165 other episodes to choose from that you can go watch at uh, transformationgroundcontrol.com. And I promise you, even if you watch every single episode, you still probably won't get through them all between now and next Wednesday when the next episode comes out because there's so many of them and they're long episodes. So uh, be sure to check it out, though. You can cherry pick the ones you want to watch at transformationgroundcontrol.com and uh, be sure to share it with your colleagues as well if you think anyone would benefit from this. And uh, again, the show is produced by Major Tom Productions, sponsored by Third Stage Consulting, which is uh, the company I work for. Third Stage Consulting is an independent tech agnostic consulting provider that helps clients with digital transformations. You can learn more about us by reaching out to me directly, or you can contact us using the contact information in the description uh, notes for this podcast episode. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. Hope you enjoyed the podcast, and we will see you next week on Transformation Ground Control. 